Good morning, everybody. Um, and I'd like to start off by saying thank you very much uh, to Neil for the introduction, for Microbiology Society for inviting me here to give this lecture. As a microbiology, it's an honor and a privilege uh, to talk at the microbiology um, meeting. So um, I did this work. Well, actually, I did none of it. It was Tanya Narancic who did all the hard work. Uh, she's a postdoc in my lab, and she actually led uh, all of the experimentation work. Um, and I'll um, tell you uh, about the work that she, uh, that she carried out. So I suppose the first question is, uh, there's an old phrase, plastic is fantastic. Um, and in many ways it is. Uh, and we can judge how fantastic it is by the number of products that it's actually used in. Uh, and we produce over 320 million tonnes of plastic, or we did in 2015 uh, globally. And that's actually going to rise to over 600 million tonnes uh, by the year 2035. So there's a huge demand for it. And the plastics industry tells us that plastic is lightweight and strong, and they're right. Uh, and therefore, it can help us to reduce greenhouse gas consumption, for example, or greenhouse gas production, uh, because we can have uh, cars that are lighter, more fuel efficient. Uh, and also our, ho our houses. Our houses contain a lot of plastic, contain a lot of polymers, petrochemical-based polymers, uh, that insulate and reduce our need uh, for uh, fuel in order to heat, uh, heat our homes. It employs a phenomenal number of people. In Europe, it's 1.5 million uh, people uh, and has an annual turnover of 340 billion euros. So it's a significant contributor uh, to the European economy. And plastics are very recyclable. The problem is that recycled plastics are not highly desired. But if you recycle a million tons of plastic, it is the equivalent of taking a million cars off the road every year. So this is, has a, can have a phenomenal environmental impact. The problem is that plastics are not very well recycled. And in Europe alone, we produce nearly 26 million tons of plastic every year. We are one of the highest recyclers of plastic in the world. The average global uh, recycling rate is actually um, in single digits, and we're actually at around 30%. The problem is that recyclate that is made is actually making up only 6% of the demand of total plastic consumption. And so therefore, there's a bottleneck in the system because the quality of that recyclate isn't good enough. And also, the cost of that recyclate doesn't compete with virgin um, polymer. 31% of plastic waste is actually incinerated, and the rest goes to landfill. And while incineration gives us uh, heat, gives, can generate electricity, um, it actually also contributes to greenhouse gas emissions. And plastics production and plastics incineration combined contribute over 400 million tons of carbon dioxide annually. And the problem with plastics is that we have a throwaway society. And so plastics have single use. And within one year of their manufacture, they usually end up as waste. And some of the culprits you will, uh, you will know, uh, for example, plastic bags, cutlery, plastic cups, coffee lid cups, or coffee lids, um, and also straws. They actually make up 50% of all beach waste and that is found, found, found on beaches. And it's a single-use and throwaway society that is really uh, one of our major problems. And so what happens to that plastic? So in the EU, 500,000 tons of plastic actually enters the ocean each year. And as we've heard from Neil, globally, up to 13 million tons of plastic enters into the ocean um, globally. And 80% of marine litter is plastic, which is really is a phenomenal statistic. And about 300,000 tons of microplastics exist in the ocean. And those microplastics exist when plastics start to fragment in the ocean, but also they actually come from land, where plastics aren't managed properly, and they actually make their way into rivers and into oceans uh, and cause pollution. And we know that these plastic fragments are being consumed by uh, fish, for example, because they mistake them for plankton. They mistake them for nutrition. Uh, and those are found then in the guts of fish that we are actually consuming. And they're also found in deep sea fish uh, that, are, um, that come up to the surface to eat at night and then uh, return to the deep seas. But it's also affecting not just uh, uh, fish life, it's also affecting coral reefs, and it's affecting reproduction of organisms like oysters. So it's having a massive effect uh, in, the, in, in the oceans. And the UN has identified this as a major problem. Way back in 2012, the UN um, had a forum on marine litter. There have been subsequent publications. And the UN sustainability goals clearly um, looks to improve the quality of life underwater. 
Uh, and one of the ways in which we can do that is responsible consumption and production of the products that we make. And plastics fall in under that sustainability development goal number 12 and 14. And so the solution to plastic waste is us. It's our attitude, it's our behavior, and really what we have to do is prevent. And what I'm showing you here is the Environmental Protection Agency um, waste management hierarchy, the waste management pyramid. And the first thing we should do is prevent waste. The second thing we should do if we can't prevent the use of plastics is we should reduce the amount of plastics we're using. So we as consumers should be looking to our supermarkets, looking to our cafeterias, looking to other um, purveyors of plastic uh, and ask, do I need that packaging? Do I need that much packaging? Uh, so we need to prevent, we need to reduce, we need to reuse. And the design of plastics should allow their reuse. Often it doesn't. Yeah? And recycling is actually way down the list of um, um, waste management in the Environmental Protection Agency pyramid. And below that is energy recovery and finally landfill. And recycling also requires design. The reason recycling rates are low is not just because of the quality of the recyclate, it's also got to do with the design of the packaging, for example. And sometimes you have multi-layers of plastic which give a certain function, but that multi-layered plastic cannot be recycled. So it's the design of the material that is critically important as well. And so what we see on the ground is actually people taking action. So for example, some of the headlines in The Guardian, Iceland said, okay, we're going to remove or eliminate all plastic in our own branded products. They're gonna to move towards using paper and pulp in order to avoid the use of plastic. So they're preventing uh, plastic production. Um, Theresa May unveiled a plan to eliminate the UK's plastic waste within 25 years. In uh, Ireland, we had um, an article recently in the Irish Times that basically said uh, plastic is not fantastic, it's time to curb its use. Uh, and so single-use plastic is something we absolutely have to deal with. And in Ireland, we actually banned plastic bags uh, nearly 15 years ago in supermarkets. Um, well, we didn't, well, actually, we didn't ban it. We imposed a tax uh, on uh, plastic bags, but in effect, it acted like a ban because within one year, 90% of plastic bags in supermarkets, uh, it's, the use was reduced, and within two years, that was over 95%, simply because you were charged 15 cent for a plastic bag. It's now around 22 cent for a plastic bag, and use of those plastic bags remains low. Uh, there was hysteria um, at the time saying, you know, people are going to die, think about the children, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's very serious, what about hygiene, etc. Um, and it was just people trying to protect their industry. And now you ask people, would you mind bringing your durable bag, whether it's cotton, whether it's durable plastic that is being reused, do you mind bringing that to the supermarket? No problem, yeah, people have no problem. So it's, uh, the biggest barrier to, uh, to dealing with plastic waste is us. And so uh, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation um, uh, has been promoting the circular economy. It's been a pioneer uh, in, in this field. Uh, and what they're saying is that the materials that we produce, we should reuse, we should recycle. We should ensure that we have resource efficiency so that we're not going back to a limited resource and constantly uh, are, are depleting it, rapidly depleting it. So what you see here on the right is uh, a technical material such as metals, plastics, you make them, you use them, and then you return and you recycle. On the other side of the equation, you have the biological world, and there you have natural resources such as uh, forestry, crops, and also waste, um, biological waste, and you can make things uh, from those, you can consume them, they can be clothing, they can be food, uh, and then you again use that and return it to nature safely. Now, those two cycles are actually separated based on the Ellen MacArthur Foundation uh, vision. I would argue that they're actually uh, linked, and I'm gonna show you something that we've done as microbiologists. We've te teamed up with chemists in order to join those two circles because there are petrochemical plastics here that we can use technology to bring them into the biological world and make them into biodegradable plastics. Uh, we can also have biodegradable plastics, like for example, polylactic acid, that actually can be recycled. So these two will start to merge uh, and will become, um, will overlap. So way back in 1999, I had an idea uh, that you could convert uh, plastic waste like polystyrene, polyethylene terephthalate. Polyethylene terephthalate is classically your drinks bottles uh, for water, for your soft drinks. 
Uh, polystyrene is polystyrene foam used in, in packaging, and polyethylene is used widely in bags, used in farm plastics, etc. Uh, and I thought we could convert this into uh, biodegradable plastics. So I went to Hamburg and I met uh, Professor Kaminsky, who had developed a technology for converting plastic using pyrolysis uh, into, into liquid um, feedstocks for fuels. And pyrolysis is effectively either a catalytic or non-catalytic technology that you heat the plastic in the absence of air, so you don't burn it. Uh, you basically break the bonds and you return it to its monomeric components. I took those monomeric components and we fed it to bacteria in a fermenter. Uh, those bacteria are Pseudomonas putida. Pseudomonas putida have the capacity to accumulate a biological polymer called polyhydroxyalkanoate inside the cells. They use this as a storage material in response usually to an inorganic nutrient limitation like phosphate or nitrogen limitation. And then they start to download uh, the carbon in the form of a polymer. It's an evolutionary response to stress in order to give them a survival. We then extracted the polymer uh, and we get a polymer and it depends on what type of uh, characteristics the polymer has. Uh, it can be a rubber-like uh, material, uh, it can be a brittle material, or it can be a liquid material, depending on what you start with the feedstock. So we have, a, we have the ability to produce a range of different polymers depending on the feedstock we start with and actually depending as well on the bacterial strain that we use. So what we did uh, in order to, we, did, we first demonstrated that technology and I'm showing you the best results, of course. Um, so I'm showing you here uh, polyethylene derived monomers. Uh, so we took polyethylene, we pyrolyzed it, we actually oxidized it as well, uh, and then fed those monomers uh, to bacteria. And what I'm showing you here is that uh, um, the bugs start to consume phosphate, it needs an inorganic nutrient, and after about 24 hours uh, it's undetectable. Uh, the bugs are growing, and basically they achieve around 100, over 100 grams of dry weight per litre, which is equivalent to about 300 grams of wet weight uh, of cells uh, per litre, which is really high cell density. Uh, and 100 is really the target if you want to make it commercially successful. Uh, and then they also accumulate uh, PHA, and they accumulate PHA around 65 to 70 percent of the cell is actually polyhydroxyalkanoate. So these guys are absolutely bursting with um, polymer. And so then what we did was, uh, and that one diagram took four years uh, to do, and it was a lot of developmental work. We worked with chemical engineers, we mathematically modeled it in order to improve, uh, improve the process. Uh, we took that polymer then, uh, and that actually technology was licensed by Bioplastic, um, uh, which you see the logo in the corner, uh, and we took that uh, polymer and we processed it to make a hot melt adhesive. So a hot melt adhesive is effectively an adhesive or a polymer that you heat up, it becomes liquid, you then take two surfaces and put them together, the liquid cools down, and the liquid then bonds both surfaces together, uh, and that's a hot melt adhesive. And our hot melt adhesive has a, a peel strength of about 7.5 newtons, and compare that to the commercial adhesive, it's, uh, it's exactly the same, and we can use that for cardboard uh, pa and packaging um, bonding. Uh, we then processed uh, the polymer in a different way to make a different product, to make a pressure-sensitive adhesive. One of the most famous pressure-sensitive adhesives would be the post-it. So you can put it on, take it off, put it on, take it off. Also scotch tape, sellotape, they have versions of this where you basically stick it onto a surface and you can peel it. So we had a peel -up, peelable pressure-sensitive adhesive. Um, its strength was around 12.5 newtons compared well to the commercial uh, and we're developing an adhesive tape for that. So we can take petrochemical plastics we can recycle them using a combination of chemistry and microbiology, and we can then, then develop products that can be used uh, as biodegradable uh, glues uh, in the market. So PHA is not the only bio-based and biodegradable uh, product in the market, and I just want to talk to you a little bit about a few of those. So the plastic bottle on the left is, is bio-based but not biodegradable. The plastic bottle on the right is bio-based and biodegradable, and also compostable. One is PEF, polyethylene furan dicarboxylate. Uh, Avantium is a company that is now commercializing that. It has the barrier, 10 times the barrier strength of PET, so it's going to be fantastic for soft drinks, for beer, even for champagne. Uh, and it can reduce the amount of uh, greenhouse gases used in transport, etc. but it is not biodegradable. So it addresses a resource issue, but it does not address end of life. If that bottle gets into the oceans, it will last for hundreds of years. Polylactic acid is biodegradable and it's compostable, 
but what about its life in the oceans? And people don't know that, and that was part of the study, and I'll show you what, uh, what, we've, uh, what we've seen. Polylactic acid can also be used in fibres. It's, it's actually one of the um, hot plastics for uh, three-dimensional printing, 3D printing. Polylactic, when it started off, actually um, thermally, uh, had thermal um, deformation at around 50 degrees centigrade, uh, but they've now solved that problem, so you can actually use PLA in coffee cups as well. So you can have a compostable, disposable uh, coffee cup. There are starch-based polymers uh, made by, for example, a company in Italy called Novamont. Uh, you see them as Matter B, the trademark. Uh, they can be used in plastic bags. In Italy, there's a ban on non-degradable plastic bags. Novamont supply the vast majority of biodegradable plastic bags into the Italian su uh, supermarkets. Uh, they also provide other packaging, like netting for fruit. Uh, BASF produce what is called PBAT, polybutylene adipate teratalate. That is actually a fossil-based plastic. It is completely 100% biodegradable, but it's fossil-based. So we have bio-based plastics that are not biodegradable. We have bio-based plastics that are biodegradable. We have petrochemical plastics that are not degradable. And we have petrochemical plastics that are degradable. And you can blend these polymers. You can blend PLA with PBAT, PLA um, with uh, other polymers uh, to make composite materials. And we don't know, actually, if some of them are biodegradable. And we, we did a study, and we'll show you the results of that now. <coughs> And you also have, for example, coffee cups that are made out of cellulose uh, and made out of cardboard. Uh, and the inner lining will be have PLA or will have PBS. Mitsubishi, for example, make a biodegradable uh, cup that has PBS, polybutylene succinate, and actually mixes it with PLA as well. So what that results in is confusion for the consumer. What am I getting? Is this environmentally friendly? Is it not? Um, it's biodegradable, great, yeah, but it's using oil. Oh, and that's running out. Um, okay, but I'll use this one, and it's bio-based, yeah, but that's actually not biodegradable. So it causes mass confusion. So uh, this is a huge challenge. So what we decided to do is we decided to look at these biodegradable polymers, whether they be bio-based or petrochemical-based, and ask the question, how do they degrade in a variety of different environments? And we split that into two. Split into managed environments, and unmanaged environments. So the first managed environment we looked at was industrial composting. And industrial composting maintains a temperature of around 58 degrees centigrade. And in order to meet the standard of compostability, uh, it must degrade within 180 days, and it must achieve 90% degradation relative to cellulose. Biodegradable is a term. Compostable is a standard. Biodegradable means it will be degraded by natural processes. But that could take 1,000 years. Yeah? Eventually, it will break down. That's biodegradable. However, what we want is bio rapid biodegradation and within a particular standard. So the first one is industrial composting. So what I'm showing you here, there's a lot of data, and I'll just bring you through this. I'm showing you biodegradation relative to cellulose, and I'm showing you the time in days. And we have up to 180 days. And here's cellulose. So cellulose rapidly degrades within the first 10 to 20 days and then slows down. And that's a classic uh, cellulose degradation curve. What we see is polycaprolactone, petrochemical-based, is highly biodegradable and actually biodegrades more relative to cellulose, uh, more, more than cellulose. TPS, which is starch-based, thermoplastic starch, also rapidly degrades, and polyhydroxybutyrate, produced by bacteria, also degrades rapidly. We see that PLA and PHO also degrade, but they degrade slower than cellulose, but still make the standard. So within 60 days, PLA has achieved over 90% biodegradation, as represented by the hash line. Yeah, and PHO has also achieved uh, that level of degradation. PBS is very, very slow. Starts off slow, then rapidly, and then slows down again, and just makes it over the line. It's 90% on day 180. Just gets over the line, yeah, in terms of meeting the standard. So you can see that they vary a lot. And PHO is polyhydroxyoctanoid. It's a PHA. PHB is polyhydroxybutyrate. It's also a PHA. So polymers within the same family degrade very differently. Yeah? And so we must remember this. Just because one polymer degrades doesn't mean they will all behave, the, the family of polymers will behave in the same way. So there's a lot of data up here. And I just want to, um, what I want to highlight is that in industrial composting, when we took PLA polymers and we blended them with PCL, PBS, PHB, and PHO, they all make the standard. They all meet the compostability standard in uh, an industrial compost. Similarly, for PHB blends with um, PO, PHO, PCL, et cetera, they make the standard. 
and also TPS. They also make the standards. So industrial composting, and I, we have a lot more plastic blends that we tried, but it always makes the standards. So industrial composting can address plastic waste because it can help to manage these plastics and have full biodegradation. Now come the problems. So in Ireland and the UK, um, we like to have a compost heap in the back garden uh, so that we can actually degrade our material uh, and use that in, in, our, in our gardens ourselves. Uh, the standard for biodegradation in home composting is actually one year and, because, and it's at 28 degrees because home composts do not achieve the same temperature as industrial composts. So what we observe here is that polylactic acid, the fastest growing biodegradable bioplastic on the market does not degrade at all in home compost. PCL, which is petrochemical based, reaches the standard and in actual fact it reaches it within six months, yeah, around six months. Uh, PHB is even faster yeah, uh, in 124 days. PHO in the same family, very poorly degraded in home composting. Uh, TPS rapidly and PBS nothing at all. So now we have confusion again for consumers because I thought this was compostable. It said it on the package, it said compostable. I brought it home, I put it in my home compost, and it doesn't degrade. I still have plastic in my, in my compost. So this is something that we have to deal with. So we, we started to look at these blends and see what could happen. We started to blend polymers. And PLA, like I said, is not biodegradable, or not home compostable. PCL is. When we add in 20% PCL into PLA, suddenly PLA becomes home compostable. We were surprised by this, our partners are surprised by this, we repeated this so many times and it always happens. We looked at scanning electron microscopes and what we found was the polycaprolactone was evenly dispersed throughout the polylactic acid polymer when we blended it and so you had pockets of biodegradation inside in the PLA and that was actually stimulating rapid degradation of PLA. So we then said, oh, could we do this with other polymers like PHB because PHB is also home compostable but unfortunately not. When PLA is blended with PHB, it is the, the composite is not home compostable. We do not get the same distribution of uh, the PHB throughout the PLA, and therefore it's, it doesn't make the standard. We tried this also with PHO and said, okay, PHO doesn't uh, degrade very well in home compost. Can we mix it with PHB, which we know is home compostable, and only just a little, because what PHO gives to PHB is flexibility. It's a rubber-like polymer. Blend that with PHB, and what you get is a strong and flexible polymer that could be used for packaging. And what we find is it then becomes, oh, sorry, it then becomes home compostable. And again, for TPS and PCL, which are both um, home compostable, we were looking for antagonism, just in case there was some antagonistic effect, but they actually both degrade as well. So home composting is giving us mixed signals. It's telling us some are home compostable. You can build in design so that they become home compostable when they're not. Uh, but in other cases, the de current design is not enough. So the design space needs to be increased. And what about anaerobic digestion? If I was to say to you, let's anaerobically digest plastic, you'd say that's madness, that can't work. Yeah? Polyethylene, polyethylene terephthalate, polystyrene, that won't work. But with biodegradable plastics, you have an opportunity. So you're offering a new end of life opportunity uh, for plastics if you substitute petrochemical non-degradables with degradables. So anaerobic digestion requires 52 degrees centigrade and 21 days of incubation uh, in order to meet the standard, yeah? the international standard. So PLA just falls short of the 90% degradation. PCL, PBS and PHO are very poorly performing. Uh, PHB and TPS are actually quite good as well. The problem is it takes a very long time for these polymers to degrade. They don't degrade in 21 days. They actually degrade in an anaerobic digester uh, in much uh, shorter time or a much longer time. So this now proves, provides a challenge to any of you who do anaerobic digestion. Can you build a consortium of microbes that will rapidly degrade plastics in anaerobic digestion? So you can speed up the degradation without affecting the degradation of other materials inside the anaerobic digester. And when we looked at biogas outputs, it's pretty much a 50-50 split between methane and carbon dioxide. In general, you're looking for, what the, one of some of the best are 60-40, let's say, and methane to CO2, but what we see is, in general, about a 50-50. But what about these plastics in unmanaged environments? What's actually happening um, when they are not managed? So, for example, in the marine. And in the marine, 
we looked at 30 degrees centigrade and 56 days. That is the standard. And you might argue, but at the marine, you're never going to see 30 degrees. But this is the international standard for measuring uh, biodegradation in the marine. They use a 30 degree standard. And they use uh, seawater that has a natural microbial flora. And so again, what you see is PLA is a very poor performer. It's around 6%. And as a matter of fact, you see rapid 6% degradation at the start, and then it flatlines. So we would actually argue that PLA, once it gets into the ocean, it'll last as long as any petrochemical uh, plastic. Uh, PCL nearly makes the standard, not quite. PBS, PHO are poor as well. Uh, PHB, almost there. And TPS was actually the only one that actually made it over the line, and it degraded in 30 days. So you're starch-based uh, starch -based plastics. So again, here in the marine, these plastics, when they get into the marine, are not going to degrade or meet the standard. They are some of them are degrading reasonably quickly, but they're not making the standard, except for TPS. And then if we look at all the blends, and I'm not going to go through all, all of them, but again, PLA performed very poorly in the marine. PHB a lot better. It actually got quite close uh, to making the standard, so you are getting a lot of degradation. So it, it, we would predict that it's going to take around 70, 80 days for PHB-based um, polymers to degrade in the ocean, which is still a relatively short time. But PLA, you're talking years, uh, hundreds of years, uh, um, the way it's looking. And also then um, PCL and PCL-TPS, they're pretty good, but they still don't make the standard. So what about biodegradation of freshwater? So what we see here, again, is PLA is very poor. Uh, PCL is not great. PLA blends with PCL, even though it's home compostable, industrial compostable, it is not degrading at all in fresh water. PHB is making the standard just about at 56 days. TPS is also making the standard, but other polymers and polymer blends are not. So again, just like marine, in fresh water, these biodegradable plastics are not meeting the standards for biodegradation, but they are, give them time, give them, let's say, 100 days, 120 days, they will degrade. So, in conclusion, are they the answer? Partly. They're not a silver bullet. They're not the panacea. People think they are. Um, so we can see that if you manage them you can, in industrial composting, you will get fantastic results. In home composting, you have to be careful. What is home compostable, what's not? Some of them are, and some of them aren't. And you can actually uh, build in design. But we need to do more design. We need to do more design of the polymers so that they become more degradable in multiple environments. And anaerobic digestion is giving us new end-of-life options for plastics that were never seen before. But the ultimate reality is biodegradable plastics need to be managed just like uh, petrochemical non-degradable plastics. And the EPA have a pyramid that says prevent and minimize, reduce, and that is really the mantra. That is really the solution to plastic waste. It is a combination of prevention, minimization, reuse, and also biodegradable plastics. They are part of the solution if they are managed. And if they are managed properly, we will contribute to less pollution in the uh, oceans, in the rivers, and it is about responsible consumption and responsible production. And biodegradable plastics are part of our, that responsibility. And so I'd like to thank the Microbiology Society for giving me the opportunity to talk. I think I'm on time. Um, I'd like to thank Tanya Narancic, because she did all the heavy lifting here in UCD and as part of Beacon, the Bioeconomy Research Center. Owen Casey, who is a chemical engineer who helped us to model the, or the uh, conversion of petrochemical plastics into uh, biodegradable plastics. Matja Guzik, who's a PhD student, who did that work. Ramesh Babu and Srinivasa Shangati, who did the polymer processing in Trinity, making all of the blends. Laura Morales, who developed the biodegradable glues. Shane Kenny, who actually um, produced all of the polymers uh, for those biodegradable glue uh, development. Stephen Verstickel in OWS in Belgium, who actually did all of the biodegradation tests. Auxi Prieto and Lars Blank, who are in uh, Sisic in Madrid and Aachen in Germany, who led two European Union funded projects where this work was done. Uh, and finally, the sponsors of the research, Enterprise Ireland, the Environmental Protection Agency, Science Foundation Ireland, and the European Union, who contributed significantly to the development of this. And I'd like to thank you very much for your attention.